Welcome back to Headlines. Today we're going to be talking about the Colorado ballot case where they kicked Trump off the ballot. I think it's uh, Trump v. Anderson. We had the Supreme Court hearing just a couple of days ago, and so I wanted to dig into that hearing and play some specific clips from some of the justices and kind of go through that. But um, so far, it was looking very good for Donald Trump, uh, just going through the hearing and listening to what the justices were saying. Uh, so I'll when we get done, I'll make some predictions. I mean, from a patent lawyer, comedian, those are the kind of predictions that you want to rely on, right? <laughs> but, I'll, but I'll make those anyway. So um, let's start by walking through some of this article from the Wall Street Journal. Um, and you can see their headline is, uh, Supreme Court appears likely to restore Donald Trump's ballot eligibility. So, um, but let's look first at this. We're going to play this quote from the Chief Justice, Chief Justice Roberts. Um, where I think he brings up the practical aspect of this. Like, what the crap? If we let one state start to decide things like this, aren't all the other states going to do that too? Um, which is obvious, because I think when they, uh, when they said they kicked Trump off of the ballot, I believe Texas and maybe, I, I believe Texas or maybe even Florida, there were at least one or two other states that started saying, well, man, maybe we're going to kick Biden off of the ballot. Uh, so anyway, let's uh, play that clip. Counsel, what do you do with the, what I would seem to me to be plain consequences of your position? If Colorado's uh, position is upheld, surely there will be disqualification proceedings on the other side, and some of those will succeed. Some of them will have different standards of proof. Some of them will have uh, uh, different rules about uh, evidence. Maybe the Senate report won't be accepted in others because it's hearsay. Uh, maybe it's beyond a reasonable doubt, whatever. In very quick order, I would expect, um, although my predictions have never been correct, uh, I would expect <laughs> that uh, you know, a goodly number of states will say, uh, whoever the Democratic candidate is, you're off the ballot, and others uh, the, for the Republican candidate, you're off the ballot, and it'll come down to just a handful of states that are going to decide the presidential election. That's a pretty daunting consequence. And Chief Justice Roberts is absolutely correct. There would be absolute chaos if you let any one state start deciding this. Um, it's complete insanity to think this would work. Uh, anyway, so the attorney for uh, the people from Colorado who started this um, here's his uh, response to that. Um, so let's play that clip uh, where he responded to what he said. Well, certainly, Your Honor, the fact that there are potential frivolous applications of a constitutional provision isn't a reason. Well, no, hold on. I mean, you might think they're frivolous, but probably the people who are bringing them may not think they're frivolous. Um, insurrection is a broad uh, broad term. And if there's some debate about it, I suppose that will go into the uh, decision. And then eventually what we would be deciding, uh, whether uh, there was an insurrection when one president did something as opposed to when somebody else did something else. And what do we do? Do we wait until near the time of uh, uh, counting the ballots and sort of go through which states uh, are valid and which states aren't? There's a reason Section 3 has been dormant for 150 years, and it's because we haven't seen anything like January 6th since Reconstruction. Insurrection against the Constitution is something extraordinary. It seems and to me you're avoiding the question. First off, it was a riot. Okay, stop trying to pretend it was an insurrection. It wasn't. It was a riot. Um, but regardless of that, this case is about a threshold question. Should a state be able to make that decision? You don't get to the underlying merits of whatever happened until you answer the first question, which is, can the state even decide that? And uh, so the, the, uh, the, the party from Colorado, the attorney from Colorado, kept trying to just jump over that threshold question, like, it was an insurrection, it's bad. Haven't you watched MSNBC? I mean, just, I hear that all the time, just, there's no legal reasoning there. We are talking about the 14th Amendment, that section three, this is a threshold question, should a state even be able to decide that at all. My point is, I got really sick of this attorney. Um, so anyway, but uh, Justice Alito, so actually after that attorney basically said, well, you know, this is an incredible, unbelievable thing. You know, the reason why it's never been used is because it's just this extraordinary thing that happened. 
Um, and then Justice Alito actually had a response to that, the, uh, talking about impeachment that I thought was great. So let's go ahead and play that clip from, from Justice Alito. I don't know how much we can infer from the fact that we haven't seen anything like this before and therefore conclude that we're, never, we're not going to see something in the future. From the time of the impeachment of President Johnson until the impeachment of President Clinton, uh, more than 100 years later, there were no impeachments of presidents. And in fairly short order over the last couple of decades, we've had three. So I, I don't know how much you can infer from that. Now let's play a clip from Justice Kavanaugh where he brought up the fact that isn't this against democratic principles by just taking somebody off of the ballot like that? So let's go ahead and play that clip. Last question. In trying to figure out what Section 3 means, and kind of to the extent it's elusive language or vague language, what about the idea that um, we should think about democracy, think about the right of the people to elect uh, candidates of their choice, uh, of letting the people decide? Because your position has the effect of disenfranchising uh, voters to a significant degree. And should that be something, does that come in when we think about should we read Section 3 this way or read it that way? What about the background principle, if you agree, of democracy? And here's Justice Barrett saying that this kind of thing just doesn't seem like a state call. How do we review those factual findings? Why should clear error review apply? And doesn't that just kind of buckle back into this point that Justice Kagan was making, you know, that we made with Mr. Mitchell, too, that it just doesn't seem like a state call? Now we're going to flip over to this uh, article from Blaze Media for a few minutes. They had identified some other quotes um, that I thought were, were good for us to play, and I wanted to, to play a couple of these. And the next one is from Justice Kagan. So she is one of the liberal justices, and from her questions, she seemed like she was um, not on board with this uh, taking Trump off the ballot. Like I think she seemed very firmly in this is going to be a whole... We're a whole can of worms. We don't want to do this. Um, <laughs> that's my legal, my legal explanation for what she said. But so let's go ahead and play that clip from Justice Kagan. But maybe put m most boldly, I think that the question that you have to confront is why a single state should decide who gets to be president of the United States. In other words, you know, this question of whether a former president is disqualified for insurrection uh, to be president again is, you know, just say it. It sounds awfully national to me. Um, so whatever means there are to enforce it would suggest that they have to be federal national means. Why does, uh, you know, if you weren't from Colorado and you were from Wisconsin or you were from Michigan, and it really, you know, what the Michigan Secretary of State did is going to make the difference between, you know, whether candidate A is elected or candidate B is elected, I mean, that seems quite extraordinary, doesn't it? No, Your Honor, because ultimately it's this court that's going to decide that question of federal constitutional eligibility and settle the issue for the nation. And, and certainly it's not unusual that questions of national importance come up. Well, I suppose this state. court would be saying something along the lines of that a state has the power to do it. But I guess I was, I was asking you to go a little bit further and saying why should that be the right rule? Why should a single state have the ability to make this determination, not only for their own citizens, but for the rest of the nation. Justice Thomas was driving really hard, asking for specific examples of where national candidates had been disqualified by states. And here's some of that questioning by Justice Thomas. Uh, after Reconstruction uh, and after the Compromise of 1877 and during the period of Redeemers, that you would have that kind of conflict. There were a plethora of Confederates still around. There were any number of people who would continue to either run for state offices or national offices. So it would seem it, it, that would suggest that there would at least be a few examples of uh, national uh, candidates being uh, disqualified, if your reading is correct. Well, there were certainly national candidates who were disqualified by Congress refusing to seat them. I understand that, but that's not this case. I'm talking, did states disqualify them? That's what we're talking about here. I understand Congress would not seat them. Other than the example I gave, no. But again, Your Honor, that, that's not surprising because there wouldn't have been 
States certainly wouldn't have the authority to remove a city. So what's the purpose officer. of the — what was the purpose of the uh, — of Section 3? Uh, the states were sending people. Uh, the, the concern was that the former Confederate states would continue being bad actors. And the effort was to prevent them from doing this. And you're saying that, well, this also authorized states to disqualify candidates. So what I'm asking you for, if you are right, what are the examples? So Justice Thomas clearly not having this states being able to take people off of the ballots. Now let's go to Justice Brown. Now she was just appointed by President Biden, obviously one of the liberal justices, and she was questioning whether this Section 3 even applied to the president. So let's play that clip. Is, is that the framers were concerned about charismatic rebels who might rise through the ranks up to and including the presidency of the United States. But then why didn't they put the word president in the very enumerated list in Section 3? The thing that really is troubling to me is I totally understand your argument, but they were listing people that were barred and president is not there. And so I guess that just makes me worry that maybe they weren't focusing on the president and, for example, the fact that electors of vice president and president are there suggests that really what they thought was if we're worried about the charismatic person, we're going to bar insurrectionist electors and therefore that person is never going to rise. This came up in the debates in Congress over Section 3, where uh, Reverdy Johnson said, why haven't you included pre president and vice president in the language? And Senator Morrill responds, we have. Look at the language, any office under the United States. Yes, but doesn't that at least suggest ambiguity? And this sort of ties into Justice Kavanaugh's point. In other words, we had a, a person right there at the time saying what I'm saying. The, the language here doesn't seem to include president. Why is that? And so if there's an ambiguity, why would we construe it to, as Justice Kavanaugh pointed out, uh, uh, against democracy? And Justice Gorsuch had kind of a heated exchange with the attorney from Colorado where um, the attorney from Colorado just wasn't answering the question that Justice Gorsuch was asking. And uh, Justice Gorsuch just wasn't having it. He was saying like, uh, I'm not going to say it again. I'm, you know, stop trying to change the hypothetical. Stop trying to change the question. Anyway, he was <laughs> really getting after him. So let's go ahead and play that exchange so you can hear that. To enforce the disqualification, which is I under, That's a whole separate question. That's the de facto doctrine. It doesn't work here. Okay, put that aside. He's disqualified from the moment. Self-executing. Done. And I would think that a person who would receive a direction from that person, the president, former president, in your view, would be free to act as he or she wishes without regard to that individual. I don't think so, because I think, again, the de Why? facto officer doctrine would nevertheless come into play to say this is the No, de facto, that, w that doesn't work, Mr. Murray, because de facto officer is to ratify the conduct that's done afterwards and, and, and insulate it from judicial review. Put that aside. I'm not going to say it again. Put it aside, Okay. I think Justice Lee is asking a very different question, a more pointed one, and more difficult one for you, I understand, but I think it deserves an answer. On your theory, would anything compel a, a lower official to obey an order from, in your view, the former president? I'm imagining a situation where, for example, a former president was you know, a president was elected and they were 25 and they were ineligible to no, hold office, but no, nevertheless they were no, put into that no, office. No, no, we're talking about Section 3. And please don't change the hypothetical, okay? I'm, please don't change the hypothetical. I know I like doing it too, but please don't do it, okay? Well, now, the, the point I'm trying to make is He's that, disqualified from the moment he committed an insurrection. Whoever it is, wh whichever party, it, that, that happens. Boom. It happened. What would compel... And I'm not going to say it again, so just try and answer the question. If you don't have an answer, fair enough, we'll move on. What would compel a lower official to obey an order from that individual? So after listening to that hearing in the Supreme Court, uh, Donald Trump's case is looking very good with respect to the 14th Amendment um, and them trying to kick him off the ballot in different states. Was it going to be 9-0 or 8-0 or 8-1? I don't know. Sorry, I, I almost counted Sotomayor as not counting as anything because <laughs> when I said eight zero that was anyway um I know that Roberts is going to want a unanimous ruling and especially for something like this 
you really want a unanimous ruling so that everybody really respects it and all the people like MSNBC and CNN who uh, <laughs> are going to try to say crap about the conservative Supreme Court. If you have a unanimous ruling, it's going to shut them up or hopefully substantially shut them up uh, because you have a unanimous ruling from the court. So I hope they can get it. They have two, two ways they could do this. That section three doesn't apply to presidents or it's not self-executing. So hopefully they can get Sotomayor to agree to one of those. Because I feel a unanimous ruling would be great and that's what I think they really need. So if I'm gonna make a prediction, and again, you wanna hear me on this because uh, stand-up comic, patent attorney, <laughs> I'm the best at this, at you know constitutional law. But I would say uh, it's either gonna be 9-0 or 8-1 in favor of Donald Trump in this Trump v. Anderson case. Okay, you heard it here. Let's see what happens, right? All right, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Please like, comment, and subscribe.